This is Bold Dominion, an explainer for state politics in a changing Virginia. I'm Nathan Moore. Well, after our last episode of Bold Dominion, somebody on Reddit said that this show was trash. Well, I'm pleased to announce that this week, that person is absolutely right. This episode is all about trash. Specifically Virginia's trash, or at least trash that ends up in Virginia. So I don't know about you, but every Sunday evening I take my non-recyclable trash out to the curb. And I'll be honest, after the trash truck picks it up on Monday mornings, I really don't think much more about where my trash ends up. I think that's probably pretty typical. Probably typical for people who live in Maryland and North Carolina and New Jersey, too. But here's the crazy thing. When somebody in Hoboken or Hagerstown takes their trash to the curb, there's a decent chance that it gets dumped in a Virginia mega landfill. Virginia is a bona fide trash capital. For decades, Virginia's been the second biggest importer of trash from other states. We even accept trash from Central and South American countries. About a quarter of all the trash dumped in Virginia actually originates from outside the state. Well, one state's trash must be our state's treasure, because waste management is a surprisingly profitable enterprise. Per ton trash disposal fees in Virginia are among the lowest on the East Coast. And Virginia charges no fees for out-of-state trash imports. You can thank the state's pro-business ideology and some well-placed corporate campaign donations for that one. So where does that trash land in Virginia? Who's it get dumped on? I want you to take a moment to picture a thousand football fields. That's one mile by one mile. Now imagine all that land filled with garbage. Like, really, really filled. The garbage is stacked high, 300, 400, 500 feet tall, taller than the Washington Monument. That, what you're trying to imagine, it's probably hard to do so, but that is what a mega landfill looks like. Virginia has 15 of these mega landfills, privately run with enormous economies of scale and quite a bit of profit, and they're mostly located in low-income and rural areas. Well, now there's a proposal for another mega landfill in Cumberland County, located between Richmond and Charlottesville. And this mega landfill threatens the safety and local history of a rural community there. We unequivocally do not want this here. <laughs> we don't want this this landfill, you know, so there's like no bargaining, you know. Um, there's no, you know, no bartering for the exchange of our lives, you know, cutting short our lives. That's Queen Zakia Shabazz. She's the executive director of United Parents Against Lead, and she's the coordinator of the Virginia Environmental Justice Collaborative. In the second half of today's episode, she'll tell us more about her organization's work fighting against waste management companies on behalf of people of color and low-income communities. But first, we turn to friend of the show and Richmond-based journalist Peter Galaska. He tells us about how Virginia became such a dumping ground, and how the state has managed to keep it a hidden issue. Oh, so Peter, this week's episode is one of those topics that comes from just kind of sitting around the newsroom and 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 shooting the bull. Uh, <laughs> you and I were talking uh, a few days ago about uh, uh, stuff going on in the state, and you turned me on to something I really didn't know about, which is that Virginia imports a hell of a lot of trash from other states. Um, take me through the story. Well, it's actually an old story. Virginia has been number two in the country in accepting out-of-state and out-of-country waste. And this has been the, the case since like the 1990s when uh, Waste Management, which is a really giant, I think it's based in Texas, a giant corporation, um, built a number of big landfills in Virginia. Uh, the one up in Cumberland that's being proposed and opposed um, is owned by County Waste, which is another out-of-state big management company. I think they're, they're based out of New York. Anyway, so it's really, it really goes to show what's been simmering here for at least 20 years. Yeah. Let's let's back it up and, and talk about some of the history of, of trash in Virginia. There was a time when each city, municipality, kind of had its own landfill somewhere, and it would just take the trash from the city and go dump it in the landfill. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that has really been outsourced a lot in recent decades, and now you've got a much, much more centralized operation in Virginia. I think I read <laughs> that uh, there's really only seven mega landfills around the state, um, and, and most municipalities, including Charlottesville and Albemarle here where I live, there's no landfill here that gets shipped off to a mega landfill closer to you in Chesterfield. Right. Well, here's the deal is that um, the, in the waste industry, which is a hugely profitable industry, um, you know, you have um, uh, been a great deal of consolidation 
um, you know, where you have big companies coming in and buying up little companies and landfills and putting it all together or building a whole new landfill that they can operate in a profit making way uh, in the late in the 1990s and early 2000s from then on a lot of the, these companies especially waste management were giving money to both uh, parties and this is over a period of years and what this did was you know fuel the the path for big you know out it's not just to benefit virginia obviously i mean we're taking the biggest um exporter of trash historically have been like places like north new york city new jersey washington dc north carolina and what's interesting is that according to the virginian pilot uh 24 states all, overall uh, send trash to Virginia, including foreign countries such as Canada, Mexico, and a number from Central and South America. So you've got to ask a question, why us? What do we get out of it? You know, Peter, that's my uh, my next question to you, really. But I want to kind of talk a little bit more about what the volume of trash is we're talking about. It's it's 5.8 million tons of trash per year. Yeah, I think the peak was uh, 7.7 million tons in 2004. Mm -hmm. And then in later years, it kind of hovered around 5.5, 5.3 million tons a year. Yeah. And there's been a recent spike. And one of the reasons the trash is here is that Virginia charges um, in imported trash uh, senders among the lowest fees in the country. And it must be some mentality that we're the pro-business state, you know? Being like the world's dump is not exactly the uh, Virginia for lovers, trash lovers, I don't think is quite the slogan and they're going for with that. Um, but here we are. I mean, and, and that 5.5, 5.8 million tons of trash per year imported to Virginia, I was, I was shocked that's a, a quarter of all the trash that ends up in Virginia. I mean, actual Virginians might generate mm -hmm. 15 or 16 million tons of trash, but imports are another five or six. That's a lot of garbage. Right. Well, the other thing is of concern, too, if you read the stories, is that, um, you know, a lot of times the laws do not require these companies to keep very detailed records of what they're accepting. Obviously, they can't accept certain hazardous chemicals and, and, and items. But, you know, are they really sealed? Is, are there liners underneath to prevent it from leaching into the groundwater? And they also tend to be in poor areas, um, say, in the peninsulas. Um, sort of more remote areas. I know there's a big one. Uh, waste management has a big dump. In Amelia, in the Cumberland County uh, case, if it goes through, um, that would handle hundreds of trucks a day bringing garbage in and 24 hours a day. So if you live nearby there, and Cumberland is one of the poorest counties in Virginia and only has about 10,000 people, and they're trying to fight it, but you know, what are you going to do? Well, Peter, you and I have talked a lot about other kind of corporate power and big money in Virginia here. And I know the scale is different when we talk about something like Dominion. But mm -hmm. at the same mm -hmm. time, big company that, that has national ambition, making lots of profits off of environmentally awful stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, what, what makes this different? Why, why, have, why is this not a bigger issue? Well, it was. I mean, it sort of died recently, but... But it's always been around, and now it's coming back again. And one of the issues that one of the reasons why Virginia gets so much of it is because of its central mid Atlantic location. It can get it from the north, like New Jersey and New York City, and from the south, like North Carolina. And uh, they don't want to deal with their waste. So it comes here. Sure. And our fees are certainly a lot lower on a sort of per ton basis than, you know, New Jersey, Massachusetts, yeah. places like that. You know, Northam proposed a, a an extra basically $5 per ton, you know, state fee that would also you know, presumably increase state revenues. Um, mm -hmm. And that did not go through. Why? Uh, yeah. What's going on? Well, you know, there's this kind of mentality among the General Assembly about the, especially the older, older people, that um, we have to have this pro-business image. Now, that's fine if you're trying to, you know, bring in well-paying, sustainable, useful, non-polluting industries. But the mentality doesn't quite go around that. And they think that if you start having higher fees and greater regulations, it's, a, it's an original sin. You know, it's bad. And, of course, what you're doing is, is risking Virginians' health and the environment for, because of this kind of crazy mentality. This whole waste importing mentality and situation has been around for years. And it's still growing. 
Peter, I'm noticing an interesting uh, confluence, too, around kind of how this all got started. And I, and I noticed that, that Virginia started keeping track of trash imports in 1998. There was some kind of increase in the late 90s, early 2000s. Mm-hmm. Um, waste Management, the big waste disposal mm-hmm. company that you and I just talked about based mm-hmm. out of Texas, they started donating thousands of dollars to both Republicans and Democrats in 1998. Mm-hmm. And that mm-hmm. continued into the aughts. Um, what what factors might have led to all of a sudden a lot more trash coming into Virginia around the turn of the millennium? I think it's sort of, sort of uh, corporate forces and market dynamics are probably great. You were you know, responsible for this. What you had were, I remember back in the late seven, uh, 1970s and early 1980s, there were two big players generally in the waste business. One was waste management and the other was Browning Ferris. They were you know, really pushing this novel concept of the huge trash company and not your local county landfill and and then they were they were really consolidating it there was a mad buying spree uh going around where these companies would go and pick up smaller ones mom and pop operations or local government run ones that the local governments didn't really want to have to bother with anymore and these people would come and say you know we can do this much more efficiently and safely and they had a lot of pr about it and they kind of grew into behemoths and there was uh, money to be made in running a, a sort of a highly centralized um, operation. And, you know, you could run several landfill, huge landfills more cheaply than a bunch of little scattered ones. And Virginia just bit, you know. I do want to ask about the uh, the proposed mega landfill in Cumberland County, but also the other seven that are in the state. I mean, how did the decisions get made about where these go? Well, I, what happens basically is, of course, the companies come in, start surveying land, and they, you know, write up proposals um, and send them to, you know, the planning department and the board of supervisors and things like that. Um, and they add some goodies and there are some kind of uh, cheap goodies. Let me see where I can find that. I know that in the Cumberland case, um, Green Ridge has come in and, and wants to give, I think it's $60,000 to the county. And get this, they, they want to offer $4,000 for school band uniforms. Well, I'm sure the kids would like that. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, yeah. I mean, there's a whole bunch of studies out there about the, the health effects of living near a landfill. So, you know, when we put these in places, somebody's going to suffer for it. You know, like you said, this was a bigger issue at one point back around 2000, 2004. <clears throat> um, <laughs> politicians from both sides of the aisle, some of them, um, made noise about this. Have we just sort of gotten to a place where Virginia accepts it doesn't think it's a a big deal anymore i don't i don't quite understand how this fell off the radar well it can get back on the radar and here just take the example which is just just very recently a few or three four years ago about coal ash duke energy down in in north carolina had a big uh, coal ash uh, retainment this is the ash from coal that was burned to generate power and some pipes broke and so a great deal of of, uh, coal ash waste went into the dan river and flowed northward into Virginia near Danville. And that raised a big outcry. And meantime, Dominion was trying to, uh, had a number of coal ash pits, um, uh, like Bramo Bluffs on the James River and Chesapeake and one up near on the Potomac. And they just wanted to do the cheapo way of, um, you know, securing it uh, because they did want to dispose of it somehow, but they wanted to do it um, on a cheap way. And somehow the combination of the Dan River mess and people interested like the sierra club and other even like you know kayaking groups and then this sort of coalition comes together and uh of you know sports enthusiasts environmentalists people municipal leaders politicians and now they forced they forced uh dominion to greatly tighten how they were going to um handle the coal ash so can something like this happen as far as garbage i don't know it could be problem is usually something really bad has to happen first which is really sad i mean what comes next with all this trash in virginia well first off it's going to be really hard because the obviously as you've noted from the um, political payments and donations um it, they're pretty well entrenched and um you know it's the same thing as dominion i mean clean virginia a um, progressive organization is really trying to identify politicians in Virginia who do not take Dominion's money. And I don't know, there, there, there's a number of examples where it sort of come together, but 
as I say, this is a hidden issue, and um, and somehow high, being keeping a very low profile really helps these country, companies make money because they're still pulling in the garbage from Virginia, and a quarter of, of their total comes from out of state, and that's because other states don't want to deal with it, and Virginia is willing to accept it for very little. So you've got to get rid of that mentality, you know, like we, we're going to sell ourselves because it's capitalism. And that's great because we're a pro-business state, you know, um, you want that in some ways, but not in others. And this is obviously one way you don't want that. Peter Galaska is a journalist based in the Richmond area. Stick around. In the second half of today's show, we'll talk with Queen Zakia Shabazz, the coordinator of the Virginia Environmental Justice Collaborative. You're listening to Bold Dominion, a state politics explainer for Changing Virginia. Visit us online at bolddominion.org. Have a friend who's trying to get into state politics? Well, tell them about this show and then subscribe. Find us online in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever fine podcasts are served up. Hey, while you're there, go ahead and give us a five-star review. We like those. Bold Dominion is a member of the Virginia Audio Collective, online at virginiaaudio.org. Check out all the podcasts from the collective, from science to history to music to community affairs. We amplify the voices of people in our community and help them tell stories that matter. You can listen and subscribe at virginiaaudio.org. So earlier in the episode, we talked about Virginia's quiet business in trading trash for cash. But what do these pro-business interests mean for the health and safety of Virginians living near mega landfills? Bold Dominion assistant producer Annie Parnell spoke with Queen Zakia Shabbat, who just wrote a piece about this in the Washington Post. She's the coordinator of the Virginia Environmental Justice Collaborative, which works to support the health of communities overburdened by pollution in Virginia. Could you give us some context for the term environmental justice for those of our listeners who might be unfamiliar with it? Environmental justice means um, fair treatment and engagement of uh, communities and the people that have the potential to be um, impacted by any kind of um, pollutant entities or you know, any type of environmental harm. And we were successful in getting an environmental justice, an EJ bill passed in, um, in 2020 that we are hoping that Virginia will, <laughs> you know, will, sub- will subscribe to and actually, um, you know, start taking it seriously and not, um, you know, not putting our people at further risk in, in what we call um, environmental justice communities, fence line, front line communities and sacrifice zone communities. Centering them in on Virginia, what are some of the ways that our waste disposal system in this state disproportionately affects low income communities and people of color? Well, first, it always targets um, low income communities because it feels that um, that they won't have any, any opposition, they won't have a voice, and won't, won't have anyone to contest, won't have a fight. But um, it adds to the c- cumulative impacts of um, illnesses, uh, you know, that, that they're already faced with. So it exacerbates that when we talk about um, air quality and uh, COPD and the, the high rate of, of asthma. Uh, you know, in children and adults, and when we talk about, um, you know, our way, our water being contaminated, <laughs> you know, our groundwater, you know, where else do we go for a source of water? So we're talking about our air, our water, and and then our soil. You know, where do we um, plant plant our food to grow? And um, it's just that there's like no regard for what it does to the lives of the people living there. Um, just for a dollar, <laughs> you know, it's like um, you know, profit over people and so we've been trying to um to point out how wrong that is you know and how to have the disregard and also to give um you know the communities put the power back in the hands of the communities you know that we're not just going to sit quietly by you know and let you harm us for for generations to come because basically you know you're you're killing us Mm -hmm. right well definitely very important work um so kind of to zero in even more on this proposed mega landfill in Cumberland County, as you've written, um, this would have some serious impacts on a historic black community in Virginia. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, this is um, AMMD um, Pine Grove um, community um, where there's a, a historic Rosenwald school 
um, for one, and the landfill would be like within within feet, you know, of that. We will, it will desecrate that land and that memory and that history. So we want to preserve the culture and the history, and it will also de desecrate um, burial grounds that are, you know, in close proximity right behind the school. And so, um, traditionally, our communities have not been able to say "not in my backyard," you know, so everyone else can say. Um, you know, put it put it over there, you know, but we have up until this point have not our voices have not been heard but we can ward you know, ward off that. So we want to protect the Pine Grove School. There are still um several members um that attended the school, you know, so that, that history means something to, to them, at least if it means nothing to anyone else. And now that um the school has gotten the recognition um, they are um, on the, on, are eligible to be on the state and national list of historic places. So we feel that it's, you know, it's worthy of protecting and in addition to protecting the, the homes and the lives of those people that still live, you know, in the Pine Grove area. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that, that we support that, that community. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so where is um, VEJC currently concentrating their efforts with regard to this project? We are now helping to, um, we, we haven't talked with the Department of Transportation because there's um, talks about rerouting the highway, <laughs> which will, mm -hmm. will go around the school, but it still doesn't, you know, doesn't alleviate all of the damage that, w that will be done. So we're, we're basically in a supportive mode um, and, 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 and we are being guided by what the community wants to do. That's one thing, you know, we, we you know, it's community led. We don't go in and dictate. We're just more there to support. So we're supporting them in that effort. We're supporting them and, and not, not, um, bargaining with, um, Green Ridge, but in saying we unequivocally do not want this here. <laughs> we don't mm -hmm. want this, this landfill, you know, so there's like no bargaining, you know, um, there's no, you know, no bartering for the exchange of our lives, you know, cutting short our lives. And so we just, we really um, supporting them and saying we don't want the, don't want the landfill place there. Mm -hmm. So as we kind of touched on when we first started talking, um, in last year's state legislative session, the state of Virginia did pass the Virginia Environmental Justice Act, which makes it state policy to sort of prioritize environmental justice and these issues of environmental racism. So what does that policy look like in practice? Well, it looks like um, DEQ, the Air Board, the Water Board, and them really hearing people when they have a, a, a listening session. You know, someone once said, um, you know, but they have a listening session, but they need to have hearing sessions. <laughs> you know, so really hearing the people and, and, and taking into account what's said, but then acting upon it and 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 letting that the people's voice weigh out on on whatever profit or whatever they may be paid by the the um, corporation you know that's uh, that's applying for the permit and then taking into account the cumulative impacts and how this will affect people's lives um, and livelihood um, and 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 then property and so um, we want them to have to see. To have an environmental justice lens through all the, throughout the, all the state agencies, and so we now have an interagency working group in place um, that's supposed to ensure that um, DEQ has hired a new environmental justice director, and we are in constant contact um, with her, um, and just making sure that you know that that is taken seriously, and that when they talk about environmental justice, that they take into account for the natural, the cultural, the social, economic, and political components of a community. We're not just talking about um, you know the air and the water and the natural, but all you know the cultural and historical um, aspects of a community as well have to be taken into consideration when we consider environmental justice. And so we just want um, DEQ to, you know, to act like they have a clue and to really, really, you know, be serious about environmental justice. As you said earlier, we're not just lip service, but uh, we need to see it in action. And I think, you know, we, we were able to see that with the stopping of the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. We are now also um, in opposition to the Mountain Valley Pipeline. And so just um, keeping our, our, our communities um, together through strength and unity and standing, um, you know, as, as one solid wall, you know, against these um, polluting entities. Um, I, I think we'll continue to see some wins, and that's very important 
you know, in the state of Virginia where, um, you know, we've had lots of lots and lots of disparities, especially in communities of color, you know, low income communities, indigenous communities. And, um, you know, it's time now for, um, you know, for us to have some um, some some racial equity, environmental justice <laughs> and Virginia has has shown good faith and, um, you know, with us getting the act passed. But now, you know, it's time for the action. Would you say that there's a worry then that the Environmental Justice Act is lip service? Yeah, um, for me, you know, I'm, I'm always optimistic, but there is there's always that worry until I actually see it, <laughs> especially coming off this last um, session, General Assembly session, when we didn't get any gusto, maybe because of, you know, everything was virtual and dealing with COVID, but um, many of our environmental justice bills did not get passed. So coming off of the success of getting the EJ Act passed, you know, we expected more and, and that just didn't happen. So, um, you know, we are regrouping. Um, we have an EJ policy team that actually, um, you know, drafts the policy. And so we hope, you know, we're looking for success, um, you know, as we go into this next session, even with the special session coming up and asking that environmental justice get the funding that it deserves, you know, so that we can um, continue to offer support to these communities, but real meaningful support by um, going into the communities and, and seeing, you know, what they're dealing with, um, hearing what they're dealing with. So we, we've created an environmental justice map, you know, for that purpose. We have the EJ Council that has now um, started going into to those communities. So they actually need to see that, you know, we're dealing with people and not just not just numbers, you know, not just the statistics, but these are, you know, real lives that are being in, in, impacted and um, that these people sitting on the boards have the opportunity to make the right decision. The vote is in your hand. Think of it, you know, would you want this in, in your community? Would you want to be drinking water that's contaminated with lead or any of the other poisons and that's why we are so um you know adamant against the landfills because what's what's being permitted you know who's checking that there's still a lot a lot of work to be done virginia has made a good start but we want to hold them accountable and make sure that um we can turn you on the path of ensuring that you know everyone really has environmental justice mm -hmm. so what are some of the priorities leading into the special session that's coming in august well, we gonna we want to build upon um, the EJ Act, make sure that the interagency working group are all um, adopting, you know, environmental justice. We still are again having talks with the EJ director to um, to bring her up to speed because she's coming from from Tennessee to bring her up to speed on uh, the um, mechanisms of environmental justice in you know in Virginia and, and just some of the issues that that we've been dealing with over the past years. And again, just um, standing with those communities, pointing out the communities. You know, we have um, Brown, the Brown Grove community that's dealing with the Wegmans Distribution Center. Um, so, so, so many communities around the state that have similar issues, and just just bringing all those together, putting them in front of um, DEQ, putting them in front of the legislatures, and saying, "Okay, here is, um, you know, we have an EJ Act. Let's, you know, let's implement what we have in place. You know, let's just mm -hmm. use what we have." We have the EJ Act, and as you said, the VEJC has been trying to push the state to kind of act on that act. Are there any other um, further steps that you'd like to see the state take or similar issues to the mega landfill? You, I know you mentioned the Wegmans Distribution Center. Yes, I would like um, to really see the state, um, you know, look upon, um, you know, environmental racism. And, and consider, you know, reparations, the payment of reparations, since a lot of these communities be intentionally be, were, were made into EJ communities intentionally, you know, through redlining and all of the other um, practices, you know, that were, um, you know, traditional to keep um, other people oppressed. So I would love to see the state um, seriously think about um, some, some compensation to the harm that's been done, to the damage that's been done that's caused this great disparity. You know, you hear people, hear them talking about um, COVID-19, you know, um, but the, the disparities were already existing, you know, even before the pandemic, um, you know, there, there was a whole lot of... Um, a, a, a distance and in the well, you know, just talk about wealth and generational wealth. So when you talk about environmental racism and how African Americans were systematically 
um, shut down and cut off from uh, from uh, obtaining uh, the generation of wealth. So th that that's why that gap is there. So I, I really do seriously think that that needs that needs to be addressed. The state should seriously consider um, in all of these um, the rescue care and the different funds that they're getting. So put that towards environmental justice and make sure that it gets into the communities and not handled by someone outside the community where it has to trickle down and, and then the community is left in the same position or worse off. Just even talking about community control funds, just putting the power back into the hands of the community because we're suffering um, the disproportionate burnt brunt of the injustices. So why shouldn't we also be able to um, to to be funded to to remedy the to remedy the problems and so I I would definitely say um we need to be talking about some forms of um of reparations to people that have lived and died in environmental justice communities. Queen Zakia Shabbat is the coordinator of the Virginia Environmental Justice Collaborative, a statewide coalition addressing environmental justice concerns. Thanks to her and also to journalist Peter Galaska for joining us this week. My name's Nathan Moore, and I'm the host of Bold Dominion. Huge thanks, as always, to our producers this week, Annie Parnell and Katherine Hansen, who also edited this week's show. Find us online at bolddominion.org. And don't forget to subscribe. It's just a click away.